Hi, and thanks for joining me. We're out on Goldie, the BSA Gold Star, filling in some missing gaps from the winter rambles, and we're picking up from the last video. We'd been to Corwood, and we're now heading towards Rickall. This is the village of Kelfield. It's recorded in the Doomsday Book as Chelchfelt and Hugh, son of Baldrick, had land here but uh, I don't think it's the same Baldrick as in Blackadder. Apologies to anyone who isn't familiar with Edmund Blackadder uh, and uh, you better go Google him. It's only a small village but for a short period in the 19th century it attracted a great deal of publicity. In 1833, a young prophetess called Hannah Beedham arrived in the village. While staying here, she claimed to have a vision where she was told the exact time and date of her death. Both local Yorkshire and national newspapers followed the story, and she became known as the Kelfield Prophetess. Thousands of people flocked to the village in the hope of seeing her prophecy come true. On the day, she had herself laid out in state in the parlour of the house where she was staying in and everybody was filing past to watch her. Needless to say, she failed to die at the appointed time, which was 9pm on the 1st of August 1833. She actually died six years later, in 1839, at the age of just 27. According to her obituary in the Yorkshire Gazette, she'd got married shortly after her prediction and had two children, but she'd passed her last days in distress and poverty. What a sad tale. Recall now. And this is a medium sized village with a long history. It's recorded in the Doomsday Book and the name comes from a person's name, Ricker, and the suffix Hal, meaning a nook of land. In 1066, Harold Sigurdsson, or King Harold III of Norway as he was, sailed up the Humber estuary in a fleet of longships landed on the banks of the River Ouse and set up a base camp at Rickall. Shortly after, he had a big victory over the Northern Earls at the Battle of Fulford, just up the road. It didn't last long though, because about a week later he was defeated and killed by King Harold of England at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. This is considered by many to have effectively marked the end of the Viking period in England, though they did carry on for quite a while in the Scottish holdings. 1066 was a busy and bloody year, because as we all should know, King Harold of England, after these battles, had to move down to the south coast and fight William, Duke of Normandy, who became King William the Conqueror at the Battle of Hastings. During the Second World War, an airfield was built just to the east of the village. RAF Rickall opened in 1942 and was mainly for maintenance and training. It closed in 1945. Today, most of the sites on what's now Skipworth Common Nature Reserve. In the 1980s, the Selby Coalfield was opened up. This was an unusual setup that included several separate pits that all transported the coal by underground tunnels to Gascoigne Woods Drift Mine near Selby, where it was brought to the surface. One of the pit heads was at Rickall, close to the old RAF airfield. 
which is about seven miles away from Gascoigne Woods. The Selby coal field was closed down in 2004 as it had been running as a loss for about the last five years. We're heading down the A19 again now, but we're turning off to go through the village of Balby. That's nice of him, <laughs> fellow biker letting me through there. Actually, he's coming this way as well, as you can perhaps hear. <laughs> Either that or Goldie's just gained an extra cylinder or two. Balby's recorded in the Doomsday Book, and the name comes from an old English person's name, Bardolf, and the old Danish suffix, B, which was a farm or village, so we've got Bardolf's farm. There's a few nice old buildings left in the village. This house on the right the old vicarage, dating from the mid-1700s. Right turn at the roundabout back onto the A19 to head into the market town of Selby. Some Roman remains have been found in the area, but the town's thought to have been established around a Viking settlement called Selaton. That's referred to in the Anglo-Saxon chronicles of 779 AD. The name Selby's first recorded in a Yorkshire Charter of 1030, where it appears as Celebi. It's thought to be a Scandinavian form of Selaton, meaning Sallow Tree Settlement. We're travelling west, and on our right, just over the other side of the brick walls, is the River Ouse. From this direction, we enter the town over the old toll bridge, over the River Ouse. That's the toll booth on the right. A timber toll bridge was first built here in 1792 to replace a ferry crossing. Interestingly, the ferry crossing was still in use the following year, until the ferry sank, killing one person and a horse. The current bridge was built in the 1970s to replace it. The toll charges were abolished in 1991, when it was bought by the local council. This is the church of St Mary and St Germain, uh, and it's all that's left of Selby Abbey. This is another Grade 1 listed building. It was originally founded in 1069 as a Benedictine Abbey, and grew into quite an extensive complex. It was closed during Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries in 1539. Most of the other buildings were subsequently demolished, but this part survived and became Selby Parish Church in 1618. It's had a rough old life and been altered and rebuilt on several occasions over the centuries. During the English Civil War it suffered a lot of damage during the Battle of Selby. In 1906 it was badly damaged by fire. The fire was allegedly started by workmen installing a new organ that was powered by a kinetic gas engine. The market place is here next to the church uh, and that's the old market cross dating from 1775. That's grade 2 listed. Being an old town, there's plenty of lovely old buildings, and no less than 139 of them are listed structures. All but the Abbey are Grade 2. Before we leave Selby, here's a few more little interesting bits. 
It's thought to be the birthplace of King Henry I in 1068. In the late 18th and early 19th century, it was an important port on the Selby Canal and it did have a, an extensive shipbuilding industry. It's also got links with George Washington, the first President of the United States. A 14th or 15th century stained glass window in the Abbey, called the Washington Window, includes the coat of arms of his ancestors. And it's often cited as an influence for the Stars and Stripes flag. We're heading south now, down the A19 towards Doncaster, and the next village is Brayton. That's St Wilfred's Church, and the oldest parts of it date from the 12th century. This is yet another Grade 1 building. We're doing well on this trip, we often don't see any Grade 1s. <laughs> it's got a lovely lich gate as well. This is the A63 we're crossing. just outside Burn and the bridge takes us over the Selby Canal. If you watched the previous video where we looked at Elvington, I'm assuming this is the canal where the fishermen found the body of Chen Kai Guan after he was murdered. Immediately to the east of the village is Burn Airfield. It started out as RAF Burn opening in 1942 under Bomber Command. The first squadron here was uh, number 431 from the Royal Canadian Air Force flying Wellington bombers. In 1944 RAF 578 squadron arrived flying Halifaxes. While there they carried out 2721 operations and lost 40 aircraft. There's lots of World War II airfields that we, we pass on these rambles and I don't normally talk about individual airmen. I think everyone who served in the war is special. However, this tale of outstanding bravery came up in the research and I think it just needs telling. It sort of sums up what these young men were all about. On the night of 30th of March 1944, a Halifax bomber nicknamed Excalibur took off from RAF Bern for a bombing mission on Nuremberg. The pilot was 19-year-old Cyril Joe Barton. About 70 miles out from the target, it came under attack from two German fighter planes a Messerschmitt and a, a Junkers Ju-88. It got badly shot up and suffered two of its fuel tanks being punctured, both its radio and rear turret gun port disabled, the starboard inner engine critically damaged and the internal intercom lines cut. Barton managed to shake off the two attackers by some expert flying but during the flight, due to a misunderstanding as they got no internal communication, three of the seven-man crew bailed out, leaving him with no navigator, bombardier or wireless operator. Despite all this, he decided to press on to the target. When they reached it, he had to release the bomb payload himself. As he turned the plane back for home, the damaged outer starboard engine blew up, leaving him with just two engines on the port wing. 
He managed to nurse the very damaged plane for over four and a half hours with no navigational assistance back over the hostile defences of Germany and occupied Europe and across the North Sea. As they crossed the English coast, with only about 90 miles left to go, the fuel finally ran out. They were too low for the remaining crew to bail out, so he looked for a site to crash land. He brought it to rest near the town of Ryhope, near Sunderland, steering it away from houses and buildings in the final descent. Barton was pulled from the wreckage alive, but unfortunately he died on his way to hospital. The other three crew members survived. Cyril Joe Barton received a posthumous Victoria Cross for his bravery. Sadly, there was another fatality, as a local miner was killed when he was struck by a piece of flying debris as the plane crashed. We visited the Yorkshire Air Museum at Elvington in the previous video, and Barton Road there's named in his honour. We're carrying on down the A19. There's a lot of roadworks here, and they're to do with new roundabouts and access roads to a new industrial estate. It's being built on what was Egbra Power Station. The power station with its eight cooling towers dominated the skyline here from 1967 till its cooling towers were finally demolished in 2021. There's no real sign of them left now. We're turning right onto the A645 heading towards Snaith. I'm just going to do a little detour up the road to Great Heck because there's a Grade 2 listed church just round the corner. I've passed it loads of times on this road but it's hidden behind the trees so you can't actually see it clearly. It's the Church of St Paul and it dates from 1864. Now this is the road to Great Heck and that's a name that you may remember. It made the news in 2001 when a Land Rover towing a loaded trailer travelling on the M62 crashed down an embankment and onto the East Coast Main Line just by the village. The driver had fallen asleep while driving. Shortly after, as he was on the phone to the emergency services, an express passenger train ran into the vehicle at high speed. It was deflected into the path of a freight train travelling in the opposite direction. The estimated closing speed was 142 miles an hour. Unfortunately, 10 people were killed, including both train drivers, and 82 seriously injured. The driver of the Land Rover was later convicted of causing death by dangerous driving and received a five year prison sentence. Well, I'm heading off home now. We've certainly had a fair bit of death and destruction on this ramble so I'll try and find something a bit more pleasant for next time. Please leave a like, if in fact you did, and a comment. I always try and answer them. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of my ramblings, and hit the notification button.
hope to catch you on the next one so cheers for now <laughs>